online, and I see we also have questions in the room. So let me take uh, Mao Ling from Xinhua News Agency in China. <coughs> She's having some technical issues with uh, WebEx, so I'm going to read her questions. Uh, she has two questions. First, um, the Wheel report noted the risk of world economy fragmenting further are real and could wait on the outlook. How would that impact Asia? And she also has a question on China. The Chinese economy is expected to slow remarkably, remarkably. Seems very challenging in the near term. Do you expect it to rebound afterwards? How do you see China's medium term growth? Thank you. Uh, thanks, Samaling. So the increase in trade disputes in recent years, most notably US-China trade tensions, has raised trade policy uncertainty and shown signs of early trade and investment diversion, which could slow productivity growth. And the war in Ukraine further uh, risks further exacerbating these tensions. A scenario where the world fragments into different trading blocks will lead to significant economic losses, especially for Asia, which has, been, which has benefited greatly from uh, integration. So it's important that we seek solutions that reduces trade policy uncertainty and rolls back damaging trade restrictions and avoid the sharp fragmentation uh, scenarios that which are likely in the technology sphere and energy security in the future. So that's very important to make sure that we lower the risk of fragmentation because this could really uh, affect Asia uh, in, in, the, in the years ahead. In fact, uh, there's a chapter in our uh, regional economic outlook which will be launched on October 28, which documents these losses in a scenario uh, which we use for illustration. Yeah, you also had a question on China. So on China, uh, we have lowered our growth for forecast for this year and for next year. And this reflects two key factors. One is uh, the fact that zero COVID strategy uh, is a significant headwind for growth prospects in there. The second is the continuing stress in the real estate sector, which needs to be addressed. This is in addition to the fact that external demand is weak. So in terms of how do we get growth going, it's very important that these headwinds are addressed. In terms of the zero COVID, uh, efforts need to be made to find a safe exit from the strategy. And similarly, for the real estate sector, we need to have a cogent and uh, a comprehensive strategy which addresses real estate uh, distress and revives confidence in the housing market. Beyond this, uh, in the, over the medium term, as I said, there are risks of, of fragmentation, which could arise because the world it divides into blocks. And in that context, we have to find ways to reduce these kind of tensions. And more broadly for China, I would say it's important to increase productivity, you know, address, uh, question, uh, address which, uh, issues uh, about labor uh, force decl uh, decline, and uh, greater integration uh, going forward in the light of these fragmentation. Thanks. Thank you, Krishna. Um, let me take a question from Enda Kurum, Bloomberg, Hong Kong, on WebEx. Enda. And thank you, Krishna. I wonder, I wonder, could I ask, please, given your comments on debt and inflation across Asia, how much more scope is there for policy tightening in Asia in this current policy tightening cycle, please? Thank you. Uh, thanks. Thanks for the question. So uh, just to put things in perspective, we didn't see inflation being a big factor in Asia in 2021. And that was for some very specific reasons, including a good harvest in, uh, in India, uh, a rebound in hog uh, population after the swine flu, and for the fact that rice prices did not increase so much, and which is a staple food in Asia. However, in 2022, we have seen uh, inflation rising quite sharply across many uh, countries in the region. And this is broadened from uh, increase in headline inflation to code inflation. So inflation is clearly broadening from headline to code inflation. And that reflects, in some sense, pass through from depreciation, which we, some of our analysis shows that that uh, depreciation could be more persistent in the context of inflation remaining high. So it's important that uh, countries in the region, uh, central banks in the region, tackle he inflation head on so that uh, inflation expectations don't get unanchored and central banks can maintain their credibility. So in, in some sense, given the fact that inflation is likely to continue rising, we have it peaking at end uh, 2022 in our baseline forecast, it's important for central banks to, to raise interest rates to address inflation head on. 
Thanks. Thanks. Now let's uh, come back to the room. I see some hands here. Uh, Sophie, please. Um, please uh, introduce yourself and also try to be as okay. short as um, uh, possible. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sophie Xiang from 21st Century Business Herald from China. And just you, uh, as you, me you mentioned, affected by geopolitics, uh, global supply chains are more fragmented. Uh, but in Asia, RCEP has entered into effect to promote regional uh, economic integration. How do you view the prospect of economic integration in Asia? And uh, what do you think is the key to RCEP's uh, success? Thanks, Thank you. Sophie. I'll, I'll have Sanjay answer that question for you. Thank you very much, um, Sophia, for that one. Uh, look, I think it's, been, it's important to put in context how trade has been important for Asia. You know, intra-regional trade in Asia has grown very significantly over time and is now constitutes over half of total Asian trade. Um, indeed, you know, the region is a poster child uh, for how trade can be an engine of growth um, and lift literally billions of people out of, uh, you know, lift, lift, lift living standards for billions of people. Um, and in this context, I think, you know, Krishna spoke earlier about the, the, the risk of fragmentation and, and uncertainty, um, and there's concern that, you know, this, this could go into reverse, um, uh, and, and the benefits of shared trade could go down. And, and indeed, we have a chapter in the Rio that talks about Shows, shows that. So against this prism and against this background of how important trade is, the RCEP is really uh, very welcome. It, you know, it is, uh, the, the, the signing demonstrated uh, important progress uh, showing that there is still appetite for further integration within Asia. Um, it has the potential to promote trade, uh, investment and growth. So overall we think it's a very welcome um, development. At the same time, however, I think you know, it, uh, it remains important for all countries to continue their efforts to seek also multilateral solutions, including through the WTO. So, so this is good, but, but at the same time, we, we need to also continue at the multilateral level. Thank you. Thank you. Next, uh, let's take Lalit. Thank you. Thank you for doing this, Lalit Jha from PTI Press Trust of India. I wanted to ask you about how China slow down would impact the regional economy in other countries in this neighborhood in Asia Pacific region. And secondly, a lot has been talked about during these two days about India's digitization effort. Can you give us a sense how IMF looks at it and if that can be replicated or implemented in other countries of the region in what way? Thank you. Uh, thanks, Ladit. I'll take the first question and, and pass on the question on India to my colleague, Anne-Marie. So, so I think it's very important to note, as, as Sanjay just mentioned, that regional, intra-regional trade is 50% or more for, in, of total trade in Asia. And China is a big player there. So to the extent that China slows down, right? You're already seeing the signs with China slowing. You've seen uh, growth slowing in some countries which are linked uh, to China very closely in the, in the, in the region. But more broadly, as, slow, as China slows, it's going to have spillover effects for the rest of the region. Uh, all countries, either they in, import or export to China, in that sense, if China slows, it's going to have a significant uh, impact on the region. And that's why it's important for China to address these headwinds, which we talked about, so that growth can pick up and others can also uh, you know, show signs of uptake in activity there. And on digitalization, Anne-Marie will take that one. Yeah, so thank you so much on the question on digitalization. Uh, as is, uh, well known by now that India has been a leader in digitalization over the last uh, couple of years, particularly with the provision of digital infrastructure. Um, and together this has uh, increased innovation and it has overcome some of the administrative bottlenecks that there were before. Uh, digitalization now has taken on added importance as we exit from the, um, from, from the COVID. Uh, under COVID, uh, there has been significant scarring in Asia and elsewhere, and uh, digitalization promises to be one of the avenues to increase productivity of firms. And we do have some empirical evidence uh, for that. Our forthcoming regional economic outlook will have a chapter that looks at, uh, at productivity of firms, and it shows that from the COVID recession that uh, firms that were um, at the forefront of digitalization did in fact perform better. 
of course, there are still ways to go. Um, further progress should be made uh, by narrowing the digital divide and by increasing digital literacy. And let me also mention that at the IMF, we have a program uh, that looks at digitalization and how it helps uh, governments uh, implementing uh, reforms. We call, we, we call that GovTech. And the IMF is uh, doing increasingly also technical assistance in that area. And we work very closely with, uh, with India on this, where India is on the forefront on this uh, or, uh, digital uh, gov provision of government services, which it also used during, during the pandemic in, 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 that, uh, in, in distributing benefits, which was very beneficial. Thank you, Krishna and Anne-Marie. Uh, let's take more. Here are the gentlemen in the second row. Yeah. Thank you, Ian. Uh, I'm Rizvi Nawaz uh, from Bangladesh. Uh, I am going to ask a couple of quick questions. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, yesterday and today also, I have FMD Kishi Alina. Uh, she uh, said that uh, three countries, Barbados, Costa Rica, and Rwanda, they're going, going to get the fund from the uh, Resilience Sustainability Trust Fund. Uh, so, uh, so far I know my government, uh, Bangladesh government also uh, asked for fund uh, from these. Uh, sorry. Uh, is there any uh, development uh, that you can share with us? And uh, uh, you are late, uh, so if we missed, uh, would you please tell uh, what uh, is there for Bangladesh in this uh, economic outlook? Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So, so thank you very much. Um, uh, so Bangladesh has in, in fact asked for a program from the IMF, a program that contains uh, two components, uh, a regular UCT program and uh, a resilient and sustainability trust program, as you, as you mentioned. We are currently preparing uh, for negotiation mission, for first negotiation mission, uh, to Bangladesh, which will start uh, next week. We're also using the current uh, period of the authorities here to, to already start uh, discussing some of the, some of the issues that, that, that have come up. Uh, you're asking me about the outlook for Bangladesh. Uh, Bangladesh um, is still growing strong this year. We expect 7.2% uh, of growth, but uh, there are global headwinds that are quite significant. Uh, Bangladesh is an export-dependent um, economy, and with uh, headwinds in, in its major uh, markets, we our forecast for growth next year is 6%. We also have seen um, uh, the Taka depreciate by about 20 percent. Um, uh, reserves have, have, have gone down. They are still at a comfortable level, but the direction has been towards, uh, towards going down. So with this, um, we are very uh, we're, 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 we're pleased that the authorities have been proactive in engaging with the IMF uh, in discussing economic, uh, a prog uh, an economic program that will contain measures to stabilize uh, the economy and to avoid a further downturn in the economy. Thank you. Thank you. Um, before we go, come back to the room, I have uh, received a question online from Anthony Rowley, South China Morning Post. His question is, with systemic financial risks now being flagged in just about all sectors of the global economy, sovereign, financial, and corporate, which Asian countries are best positioned to show resilience and avoid a full-blown crisis? Let me take that, Ian. So I think one, one uh, people hark back to the Asian crisis when you talk about uh, Asia here. Uh, I just want to let people know that Asia has come a long way in terms of addressing the vulnerabilities which led to the crisis in the, in the 90s. Whether you look at the external accounts, whether you look at the fiscal accounts, whether you look at balance sheets across various sectors, Asia has come a long way. You know, monetary policy frameworks are credible. Central banks have, lean, have gained a lot of credibility through the inflation targeting uh, frameworks. So overall, the underlying fundamentals in Asia are pretty strong across most countries. 
Then the, the question was about where do you see the vulnerabilities? I think one area where I worry about is the fact that if you look at uh, total debt in Asia, and you take the total debt as a share of global debt, and Asia's share has risen, has risen from 25% pre-pandemic to 38%. Now, that's quite a sharp increase. Now, in the context of uh, rising interest rates uh, and slowing growth, uh, are we going to see more debt distress? I think that's a question to ask, and that's something which we have to keep in mind. Uh, and again, um, the, the, the question, related question to that is, do we have the frameworks to deal with debt distress if it happens? Going forward, I think there are issues which we have to address in terms of long-term and medium-term prospects for Asia. I think there, there are a couple of areas where I think it's important. One, of course, is to address the issues of scarring from the pandemic, which are clearly there. And Asia is one, re uh, one region where uh, a number of kids have not gone to school for a couple of years because of the pandemic. What does that mean for uh, labor markets down the road? Similarly, uh, you know, I talked about fragmentation. That's a risk. So uh, guarding against the risk of fragmentation is, again, an important one. So these are things which are, over the medium term, important to be addressed. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do we have more questions in the room? Yes, uh, Sarah. Thanks, Ting. Um, I ha I'm Han Ting with China News Service. My question is about China. Uh, well, this year, China somewhat eased its monetary policy, like cutting interest in uh, August, and recently it announced to lower its mortgage rate, the um, housing provident fund loans, so for, to support the real estate industry. So to what extent do you think this kind of policy is going to have an impact on China's overall economy as well as the economy of this region? Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry I didn't catch your name, but uh, that's a very good question. Like I said, we have uh, revised our forecast down for, for China this year to 3.2% and, uh, and to 4.4% next year. And that reflects, you know, a key, uh, the fact is inflation also is muted in China, right? So we make the case that to revive uh, growth in China, you need to provide policy support. And to that extent, what they're doing is the right way. But we also feel that they need to provide more fiscal support so that targeted fiscal support, so that uh, improving social safety nets and so on, so consumption will rise. Now, what we've seen in China and what we need in China is actually a greater rebalancing towards consumption. And that was happening, but it was interrupted by the pandemic. But now all the policy measures we've seen recently are not promoting consumption. So they need to provide more fiscal support targeted towards boosting consumption, notably through improving social safety nets, targeted transfers, and so on. Going beyond that, I think the other headwind is in the real estate sector. I think there you need a, a comprehensive and cogent policy response, which addresses two things. One is the sale of uh, the, the, the completion of pre-sold houses. That's one thing which is very important to revive confidence in the sector. And second is property developers who are distressed. How do you resolve that? That's an issue. So these two in factors are interlinked. And addressing that in a comprehensive and cogent strategy will take a long way towards reviving, towards reviving confidence in the sector and getting growth going. And, and of course, beyond that, you have the medium-term factors like productivity, which need to be addressed. But that, we can talk about that uh, later if you, if you want me to elaborate. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we actually also received many questions on Sri Lanka. Um, let me read them and uh, try to wrap them uh, um, together. So. We have uh, Lei Kakihara, Reuters Tokyo, is asking, Sri Lanka has requested Japan co-host a creditors meeting. Would the IMF welcome such a meeting? What are the conditions for success and what role should China play in the, in the, in the initiative, as well as border moves towards solving the crisis? And Indika Sakalasuria from Daily Mirror in Sri Lanka is asking, uh, about progress toward debt restructuring negotiation, IMF's program timeline, and whether Sri Lanka could be downgraded to low income status. Uh, also, Panitha Amari Sekura from Ceylon Today is asking um, about issues of uh, reducing corruption and how much money Sri Lanka will need from other multilateral lenders to stabilize its economy. So, we have many questions on Sri Lanka. 
Yes, thank you, Ting. In fact, a uh, number of questions here. Uh, so as you all know, Sri Lanka is facing a very severe economic crisis. And let me start by saying that we are very concerned about what's going on in Sri Lanka. And we all hope that we will be able to work very fast to, uh, to end the suffering, especially the suffering of the poor and vulnerable. Uh, we have reached a staff level agreement on a four year EFF program on September 1 of this year. Um, however, the initial disbursement of this program will only come after, after the board meeting. A board meeting has taken place. Now, a board meeting uh, is, will be preconditioned on, on the uh, authorities taking certain prior actions on which they are already working and importantly on reaching um, uh, a, a solution on, on, the debt, on the debt situation so far. Uh, Sri Lanka's debt is assessed as uh, unsustainable at this stage and for the board to approve, uh, we will need two specific uh, financing assurances. The first would be from official bilateral uh, creditors we would need assurances that they will restore uh, debt sustainability uh, in the context of the program, and we need uh, uh, assurances that there are good faith efforts underway uh, to deal with uh, the uh, private private sector private sector debt. So Sri Lanka is currently working with their legal and financial advisors on this uh, on this debt element. It's uh, difficult to predict a timeline because uh, the process of debt negotiations is taking time and with what we see from different countries that went through the process, uh, these timelines differ depending on uh, what, uh, who the creditors are and, and what is involved. Um, we certainly are supporting the process as much as we can and we hope that everybody is, can work work expeditiously uh, to get to get uh, a process un underway and discussions are have been starting including with support of, uh, of, of, of all bilateral creditors that are involved um, there were other questions on on uh, on a possible uh, downgrade and multilateral other multilateral lenders on the other multilateral lenders, I would uh, say that we are working very closely with the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank, the Asian Investment Bank uh, on, on programs for, for Sri Lanka. Those programs would help uh, closing the financing gap, but I want to say also very importantly that the, that the policies under the other multilateral lenders uh, in their areas of expertise will be important to resolve uh, Sri Lanka's longer term uh, growth problems. Um, on the downgrade, all I can say is that uh, Sri Lanka is a middle income country and remains a middle income country even with the, with the decline in GDP that we have seen. Uh, the EFF is uh, not a concessional, uh, it's, a, it's a regular IMF f facility. Um, did I cover most of the questions? Yeah. Yeah. Um, let me come back to the room. Do we have any more questions? Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, my name is Thanh Nguyen from the uh, Vietnam Television. Uh, I'd like to ask you the question uh, about the, uh, econo the Vietnam. As you may know that in the last of the uh, nine months, Vietnam has the, uh, uh, increased uh, more than 7%. So uh, what do you, uh, what you see, the, uh, what do you commend the Vietnamese achievement? And uh, can, I, can I, uh, do you see the uh, Vietnamese government uh, monitoring the economy in the in the challenges wars? Thank you. On on Vietnam, let me just say that Vietnam has been among the best performing countries in the region uh, in 2022. Um, it's seen a very good recovery from the COVID la last year. So the first. Uh, Eight months of this year, we saw growth of 8.8%. Uh, uh, based on, on the performance uh, in the first part of the year, 
Vietnam was one of the few countries that we have actually upgraded uh, in, in this outlook from the previous outlook, and we expect that uh, this year um, growth will be 7% instead of 6% that we had forecast before. So the, the sources of this growth is, uh, is, is, is uh, very good fiscal support, but also vaccine and, and good uh, export performance and, and, uh, and manufacturing and also domestic, domestic consumption has picked up. Now, um, as you mentioned also there are global headwinds and Vietnam is an export oriented uh, economy so for for next year we see that uh, some of these headwinds might come to bear and we forecast that growth will be slightly lower than this year at 6.2 percent but still we see Vietnam as a, as a very dynamic uh, economy uh, to finish on on Vietnam there have been recently some um, financial chitters that uh, some of you may have heard about. Um, I would say that the State Bank of Vietnam has acted uh, appropriately with supporting uh, liquidity and uh, good communication, but I think this episode shows that there are still uh, a need, that there's still a need to improve transparency in, in, in the financial sector and to look at the interlinkages between the banking sector and the, and, the, and the property sector. Let me stop here. Thank you. We also have um, Sri Ram Lakshman from the Hindu. Sri Ram, you want to ask the questions on WebEx? Sure. Um, you've said that in your opening remarks that uh, India is going to slow down to 6.1% next year. And this is because of tightening monetary conditions um, and also um, uh, fiscal forces. So my question is, is this inevitable? And if so, to what extent? And basically, can India do anything to mitigate or counter this slowdown next year, given the overall global context? Thank you. Uh, Sriram, uh, Anne-Marie will take that question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think, I mean, to start with, I, I think in the global context, uh, the growth rate of 6.1 percent is 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 still a bright spot. So, so, but it's it's absolutely true that one needs to look at what what else can be done. And we were talking about uh, about about scarring before. So, a lot of the issues that need to be addressed are more on the on the structural side. Uh, we don't see. Um, a lot of room for fiscal support given uh, given where we stand on on, on, on on the debt on the debt level so any further fiscal support would have to be target have to be very targeted uh, to the, to the and, and time limited similarly on on monetary policy uh, given inflation situation it's it's kind of it's difficult to um, there, there, there has to be a there has to be a tight a tightening a tightening bias uh, bias there, but it is important to you know to whatever can be done on the structural front to to not uh, create imp impediments for growth and to try and also uh, create an expectation of uh, of, of of continued uh, forward movement. Uh, I think that that is really that's really important. But let me let me just come back with. Uh, you know, given given the, the growth downgrades that we have seen in other countries, uh, I think India is still in a relatively bright spot. Thank you. Thank you. We've also received a couple of questions from um, Indonesia. Compass TV, Dia Magasari is asking, what will be the biggest challenge for Indonesian economy in 2023? Uh, what about inflation rates, food prices, etc.? And she's also asking about emergent Asia. What economic policy actions have emergent Asian economies taken to address this crisis? Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm happy to take those. First, beginning with Indonesia, I think you know Asia as a whole is a bright spot relatively in the global economy. And within Asia, as we've heard from about India and Vietnam, there, there are some good, good, very good performers given the current, current context. Indonesia is another one of them. I think, you know, in, in Indonesia, we expect Indonesian economy to continue its strong recovery in 2023 uh, with real GDP growth projected at 5%, which is well above the global average. 
Um, in terms of the challenges uh, for Indonesia, uh, you know, and, and, and also for other emerging market countries, I think some of the challenges that we've laid out earlier, in particular a steeper than expected Fed tightening cycle um, and a slowdown in China, these are the two things that I think um, are particularly germane. Um, if these global risks materialize, Indonesia and other emerging market countries would face renewed currency depreciation pressures and increased risks to inflation. Um, in addition, for Indonesia specifically, you know, Indonesia is a commodity exporter. So unlike the other commodity importers, the rise in commodity prices have, have, have actually, has actually given a fillip to the economy. So a decline in commodity prices could also hit Indonesia's growth um, and current account, uh, given how important it is uh, for, for the country. However, I think, you know, um, while the global environment is challenging, Indonesia is in a relatively good position. It's got low public debt that's predominantly de denominated in the local currency in the rupiah. It is a strong set of policies and institutions that, we, that should help it through these challenges. Turning more broadly to, to what policies emerging economies have taken to address the crisis, um, you know, we have a very heterogeneous set of countries um, in, in the region, um, but they're all facing the similar challenge in one way or the other of setting policy under a very heightened global uncertainty. Um, and, and they've individually face difficult trade-offs based on the current context and the, the characteristics of their economy uh, between supporting growth on the one hand, lowering inflation, and managing financial stability risks. Um, most Asian central banks have, have been using multiple tools to respond to these shocks um, and trade-offs, um, but again, the, the mix depends on the exact uh, position of the different countries in terms of how much and how, how much they've recovered from the the COVID downturn and where the output gaps stand, and also in terms of inflation and other structural characteristics. Um, for economies where the recovery remains incomplete and inflation has um, you know, not quite uh, become as much of an issue, um, monetary policy has not yet tightened materially, and you know, we talked about China and Japan earlier in that respect. Um, in other countries where output gaps are closing or have already done so, and where inflation has risen well above central bank targets, monetary policy has been more active, and this has been particularly true in the, uh, the advanced economies in the region, in New Zealand, Australia, Singapore, and Korea. Um, in terms of fiscal policy, most economies, including ASEAN 5, um, Australia, and India, are consolidating. However, China and Hong Kong, uh, special administrative region, have also temporarily had to reverse their consolidation paths to respond to you know, outbreaks um, under the zero COVID policy. Um, and New Zealand has also announced some fiscal support packages. Um, I'd just like to conclude on this by saying fiscal policy has a very crucial role to play uh, as we face global inflation and inflation picking up in Asia. I mean, you know, it's, it's riding, a, like riding a cart, as I say, with two horses needing to pull in the same direction. And so fiscal policy, we need to be, remain very mindful to complement monetary efforts to tame inflation in the region. Um, at the same time, of course, you know, targeted and temporary fiscal transfers to support vulnerable people is also very warranted. Uh, when people face a lot of shocks, we need to protect the vulnerable, especially from high energy and food prices. Um, but these should be targeted and temporary, and to the extent possible, um, unless there is, you know, fiscal room, it should be done in a budget-neutral way. So I'll stop at that. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Sanjay. Let me come back to the room and see if we have more questions. Oh, Lali, please. Uh, this is about G20. You know, this year Indonesia is the G20 president. Next year is India's turn. Is it just a coincidence or reflective of emerging economy in, of this region? You mean who takes over the G20 presidency? You have two years successive uh, India and Indonesia becoming the G20. Uh, both are in the same region, right? So is it just a coincidence or is it reflective of this region's economic potential? Uh, it's a good question. I think this thing, these things happen by rotation. Uh, so I think it could just be coincidence, but uh, we'll clarify and get back to you on that one. I'm not 100% sure, but I think it's by rotation. So, and I think next year is, is Brazil, right? So, so I think it just happens by rotation, but we'll come back to you on that one. Thank you. Um, if we don't have more questions in the room, let me take our last questions online on Nepal. So we actually received two questions on Nepal. <coughs> Um, Saga uh, Gemeri from New Business Age is asking, how do you see Nepal's outlook, the external sector, particularly balance of payment and forex reserve, is under pressure? Some import restriction measures have been introduced in recent months in response to the stress on the external sector. 
Are they appropriate measures? What should the government do to shore up its reserves and make sure that the country does not plunge into a crisis? Um, similarly, we also received a question from Sharad Oja, Nepali Times. Nepal is suffering from the reduced forex reserve problem. What types of fiscal and monetary reform decisions do countries like Nepal have to take? Thank you. Um, as you know, uh, Nepal has a program with, with the IMF, and we have a very close policy dialogue with, uh, with Nepal. So Nepal's post-conflict, uh, post-COVID uh, economic re recovery uh, is continuing, and we expect growth to reach 4.2% this year. Um, in, however, being an import-reliant economy, uh, Nepal is suffering from um, the global headwinds that we see. So there has been, the, especially the sharp increase in uh, food and fuel prices, uh, and uh, some decline in, in uh, remittances has has led to a, a decline in in reserves in in the recent past. Um, but reserves uh, are still at above six uh, months of import. So reserves, while they have uh, come down, they are still at a comfortable level. Uh, the Nepal Rastra Bank has uh, quite appropriately already raised interest rates um, and uh, going forward, um, maintaining that tightening bias and uh, careful uh, implementation uh, and a conservative implementation of the of the budget will will be important um, to keep safeguarding macroeconomic stability uh, we also support the authorities plan to phase out import restrictions in october of this year later later this month Thank you very much. Do, um, if we don't have more questions from the room, and I don't see any questions online. So before we wrap up, I also want to remind you that, uh, as Krishna said, we will publish our full regional economic outlook on Asia on October 28th with a press conference in Singapore. So stay tuned. We will have uh, more content on Asia for you later this month. And thank you very much, Krishna, Sanjay, and Marie. And thank you, everyone here, for joining us both in person and online. Thank you. Have a nice evening.